Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. You daily dive into the news, except for Fridays and Saturdays. We've got a lot of news to talk about today, including a number of stories from earlier this week that I wanted to get to, but I wasn't able to for time. But before that, I want to let you know, tomorrow morning, Monday morning, the beautiful bastard June Drop will be going live, and it has some of the most requested restocks ever, as well as a bunch of new stuff we've never released. We've got a restock of those candles that you love so much, it sold out so quick last time. And we've even added our lace and leather skull candles. We also tweaked all the scents so they throw even better. Also, after years of requests, we're finally launching keychains and stickers, but easily what we have the most limited stock on. We're dropping our badass new backpack. It's battle tested. I've taken on a few trips. Love it. As well as our brand new limited release of cargo pants. But yeah, like I said, it goes live tomorrow morning. And if you want to be the first to get a shot at grabbing it, you can go to beautifulbastard.com right now, sign up to the mailing list and or text 813-213-4423 and I'll text you right early in the morning. With that said, we got a lot of news to talk about, so let's just jump into it. Starting with, so it appears that Netflix actually knows what the fuck it's doing because despite the near universal negative reaction to their password crackdown, numbers are going their way right now, with early data from the research company Antenna showing a massive spike in new subscriptions. Because on May 23rd, Netflix warned, hey, if people use your Netflix account, but they live outside your home, they're going to need to get a new account or they're going to get blocked. And then reportedly, Netflix average daily signups reached 73,000 from May 25th to 28th, notably a 102% increase from the prior 60-day average. With Variety adding the context, that was more than the spikes in subscriber signups during the initial U.S. COVID-19 lockdowns in March and April of 2020. Now, with that said, the negative reaction we saw online was not nothing, with Netflix subscription cancellations also increasing during this time period, but reportedly the number of cancellations was still pretty minimal, with Antenna saying the ratio of signups to cancellations since May 23rd increased 25.6% compared with the previous 60-day period. And all this looking great for Netflix, especially paired with their other win regarding ad-supported accounts, with Netflix previously sharing they had attracted nearly 5 million of these subs in the first six months. And while obviously what we're talking about here is short-term, we're gonna have to wait to see the long-term implications of everything, the way the story currently sits is this may be another example of what you see online is not what actually happens when people are deciding will I keep this or not. Rather, they don't like the change but it's not enough to make them actually change anything. At least to a degree that would hurt the company and make them rethink what they're doing. And then, Colorado just became the first state to ban courts from sending children to so-called family reunification camps. And honestly, more states absolutely need to do the same because these places sound fucking evil. And I know for those watching, some of you have some background, some are unfamiliar. I actually touched on these programs before on the show in a story about two teens in Utah who went viral on TikTok for posting live streams where they barricaded themselves in their mother's house. With them doing that to avoid a court order, putting them in the custody of their father who they said was abusive and sending them to a reunification camp called Turning Points for Families. And the judge overseeing this, making that decision, despite the fact that back in 2018, state authorities had substantiated the children's claim that their father had abused them sexually and emotionally. And despite the fact that the father was also under investigation for new allegations. Now the father, for his part, denied the 2018 allegations, claiming they were made up as part of a ploy by the kid's mother to turn them against him. And the judge somehow agreed with him, ruling that the children had been victims of what they refer to as parental alienation, which is a psychological psychological theory where one parent brainwashes and manipulates a child to cut off the relationship with the other parent. And very notably, that theory has been widely disputed by mainstream psychology and the vast majority of the field doesn't even recognize it as a diagnosable condition. But that has not stopped judges all around the country from sending kids to these so-called therapeutic camps that try to treat parental alienation. And of course, that is in no way the only horror story of kids being sent to these camps because of a theory that's widely considered to be bogus. With ProPublica, which did a huge report on those kids in Utah also extensively covering the issue and reporting on a range of different cases with a lot of it deep diving into the Turning Points program. In fact, lawmakers in Colorado even explicitly said that the outlet's coverage was the catalyst for bringing this new law about. And the other shit that ProPublica has uncovered is fucking wild. Right, according to the outlet, yes, these camps are very controversial, and while there's very little independent research in how effective they are, experts say they do not properly address the underlying issues at play. I mean, just at the get-go, at face value, many of these programs are entirely set up around denying children's abuse allegations. Right, some advocates of the parental alienation theory say there cannot be any abuse or neglect to make diagnoses. But plenty of others, including Linda Gottlieb, who operates turning points except cases that involve accusations of abuse even when those claims have been substantiated, which is exactly what happened to the two kids in Utah who were ordered to be sent to turning points. So basically, you have a system that's literally predicated on gaslighting, with Gottlieb even explicitly telling ProPublica she believes that parental alienation usually starts when people begin to believe children's claims of abuse and saying, everyone knows children lie. Lying is so instinctual. Children love to make up stories. Why on earth do we believe that children are reporting accurately? Which, just to interject, that is an absolutely fucking insane thing to say. Yes, children lie. But then to use that as a justification of, yes, and they lie about everything, is such a leap. It genuinely sounds like you're trying to make a smokescreen to keep the predators free. Right, so it makes sense that when you have a program that is structured on that belief, you're not gonna be set up for success. But then also to make matters worse, these programs are given a ton of control over the welfare of the kids that they oversee and can put them in dangerous situations with their alleged abusers. For example, under the Turning Points program, children are sent to an undisclosed location for four days for what they 
they refer to as a sequestration period, where they meet with a parent that they allegedly alienated during treatment. And after that, they're sent to stay in the custody of that parent and are banned from contacting their other parent or other related family members for a minimum of 90 days. But notably there, courts often give turning points the power to extend that period indefinitely until the children have been treated. And at this point, if you're like, there's no way I'm hearing Phil correctly. Yes, you are. Children are literally taken away from the protective parent who expressed concerns about abuse or neglect in the first place. And they are put in the care of a parent who they say abused them and then banned from reaching out to other family members for help. That's what these people fucking call therapy. And as a result, unsurprisingly, these programs have led to some absolutely horrible situations. For instance, ProPublica detailed the story of a Colorado mother who had sole custody of her two kids because an arbitrator restricted the father's parenting after hearing testimony from the children's therapist, with the arbitrator arguing that not doing so would endanger the kid's health and significantly impair their emotional development. But in August, the judge ruled, fuck all that, ruling that the children were victims of parental alienation and ordered them to do the turning points reunification program. And the mother, again, who claims that she was just trying to protect her kids from a dangerous situation with their father, was forced to foot the $15,000 bill for the four-day camp. And after the four days, the kids moved in with their father for the 90-day period, during which they both ran away and reported that their dad was verbally and physically abusive to them. But there, reportedly, the police didn't charge the father. State officials closed the case with no findings against him, even though this man reportedly didn't even deny the claims. And even after that, the father was still granted an extension on the no contact period after the initial 90 days were up, with the kids also being ordered to stay in the turning point treatment with an unlicensed psychotherapist who was taken off Colorado's roster of approved custody evaluators for violating certain standards. And even beyond that, some children who attended the turning points program have said that the program itself is abusive. Right, in another recent report published a few weeks back, ProPublica detailed the experience of a pair of 12 and 16 year old brothers who were court ordered to attend a turning points reunification camp with their estranged father in Texas. And according to people who participated in the four day session, a turning points counselor had instructed adult family members to physically force the boys to cooperate, recorded therapy sessions despite their objections, and repeatedly threatened them, even telling the teenage brother he would go to jail if he didn't participate and might not ever see his mom again. You also had family members claiming that when the boys refused to leave their bedroom and participate in what these people referred to as therapy, the counselor ordered that the door be taken off its hinges and their bedding, shower items, food, and clothing be removed. And the first day after the boys came back from their session were placed in their father's custody, the 16-year-old was hospitalized over fears he would hurt himself. And there he told doctors he had been physically assaulted at the Turning Points program. And this is according to medical records, which also documented faint linear marks on his upper arms where the teen claimed that his father had grabbed him. And as he had expected at this point, this is not the only accusation against Turning Points. With ProPublica also reporting that another teen had accused the program of abuse during his 2016 therapy sessions in upstate New York. And there, according to the police report, officers had been dispatched to the house of Gottlieb, the Turning Points director, to investigate claims that a 16-year-old boy had been dropped off at the therapist's residence and assaulted and thrown in a closet. There, we saw no charges being filed, but the patient in question also told the outlet that when he rejected Gottlieb's attempts to record his sessions, he was pinned to the floor by his father and another man. And reportedly, both Gottlieb and the counselor in the Texas incident declined to comment on specifics of that ProPublica piece. But, as the outlet noted in the most recent story about the new Colorado law, Gottlieb has previously defended her methods and called ProPublica's reporting libelous, but did not identify any inaccuracies in the reporting. But all of that brings us back full circle to the whole reason we're talking about this in the first place, the new law, with advocates now saying they hope that this will encourage other states to take similar actions. And it does appear that there is something going on, because according to ProPublica, lawmakers in California and Montana are considering similar bills to the one passed in Colorado, as well as a report coming from the UN Human Rights Council published just this April recommending the court-ordered reunification camps be banned. So there's a little more hope today for these kids and these families in a really fucked up situation. And then, you know, figuring out what's for dinner is not on the top of anyone's summer activity wish list. Not to mention the time it takes to plan meals. But thanks to the sponsor of today's show, HelloFresh, you can take your time back and get easy to prepare recipes delivered right to your door. Talking about fresh ingredients that are really tasty. And I love how each meal comes in separate bags so there's no guesswork. They really are easy to prepare meals. And no matter your lifestyle or meal preferences, with 40 recipes and over 100 seasonal items to choose from each week, this seriously saves time figuring out your week's meal menu. Also, I'll say another feature that comes in handy for Lynn and myself, the snacks that you can add to your weekly order, like the fun s'mores bundle for the kids. And did I mention that HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and most takeout? And as I mentioned before, HelloFresh isn't just for dinner. They have you covered for every mealtime occasion, from snacks and easy lunches to seasonal celebrations and festive gatherings. Or I'm talking snack boards with pretzel bites, spice bar nuts, hot honey peach jam. So what are you waiting for? Go to HelloFresh.com slash 16Phil and use code 16Phil for 16 free meals and free shipping. I know, that's right. HelloFresh.com slash 16Phil and code 16Phil gets you 16 free meals with free shipping. It is honestly a no-brainer to so try America's number one meal kit today. And then, it feels like everywhere you look right now, people are cutting staff. A lot of that going down in the news space with the Los Angeles Times now cutting 13% of their staff. But we're also seeing it with platforms in the online entertainment space. So some of the major shifts happening in podcasting happening over at Spotify right now. With that including layoffs and some new creative strategies. With the company releasing a statement this week saying, going forward, creators will be at the front and center of their vision. But saying that'll come at a cost. Writing, we are expanding our partnership efforts with leading podcasters from across 
across the globe with a tailored approach optimized for each show and creator. This fundamental pivot for a more uniform proposition will allow us to support the creator community better. However, doing so requires adapting. And as far as what that meant, it meant making the difficult but necessary decision to cut about 200 staffers. And adding that the company is combining Parcast and Gimlet, which are two studios that it acquired back in 2019, and those will be rolled into a venture called Spotify Studios. News that had a wide range of responses. With us seeing Parcast and Gimlet's union putting out a statement saying this is all a result of mismanagement and that Spotify wasted the huge opportunity it had when it purchased the studios. But then at the same time, you had outlets like the Washington Post saying this really isn't shocking news. Noting that Spotify's choice to focus more on creators aligned with its move in recent months to focus more on individual personalities rather than shows like news programming or true crime series. With recent examples like Emma Chamberlain just inking an exclusive podcasting deal with Spotify in November, and that currently sitting in the top 20 of Spotify's podcast charts. And that in addition, of course, to the famous Joe Rogan and Alex Cooper deals, with Joe still sitting at number one and Caller Daddy sitting at number four. So you have people arguing it makes sense that they're leaning into this. But at the same time, you have people saying this isn't going to be guaranteed success, with one professor telling the Post that this space right now is kind of a bursting bubble, arguing podcasts can't defy the law of supply and demand. Supply has proliferated. Demand has not. Pair that with a dip in advertising spending and something has to give. But as far as if this is going to work out for Spotify, time will tell. And then, my new nickname for Donald Trump is the two-time. Not only is he the only president to be impeached twice, he has now been indicted twice. Though notably, this time we're talking about federal charges. Also, some of his other nicknames, he could be a uh, evil Michael Scott or the dumbest fucking man on the planet because the indictment was unsealed on Friday and wow. So many things we're going to need to talk about. We're going to end up talking about everything when we stretch it across the week and just in, in bite-sized sections that make it easier to consume. But easily, one of my favorite things in this whole situation where Donald Trump was just indicted by a federal grand jury in connection with his mishandling of over 100 classified documents is you know how he made that bullshit claim where he was like, hey, when I took all those classified documents from the White House, brought it to Mar-a-Lago, I declassified them. I just thought it declassified. Something that resulted in many experts going, no, that's not, that's not how it works. But here's the thing, we know Donald Trump doesn't actually believe the words that were coming out of his face because, I'll just read part of page 15 of the indictment. On July 21st, 2021, when he was no longer president, Trump gave an interview in his office at the Bedminster Club to a writer and publisher in connection with a then forthcoming book. Two members of Trump's staff also attended the interview, which was recorded with Trump's knowledge and consent. And upon greeting the writer, publisher, and his two staff members, Trump stated, look what I found. This was the senior military official's plan of attack. Read it and just show it's interesting. And at one point in the recorded conversation that Donald Trump is on, Trump talking about these documents say they're highly confidential. Staffer responds while laughing, yeah. Trump specifically says, secret. This is secret information. Look, look at this. And then later on in the conversation, you see a staffer say, I don't know, we'll we'll have to see. Yeah, we'll have to try to. Trump says, declassify it. With him specifically going on to say, see, as president, I could have declassified it. Now I can't, you know, but this is still a secret. Staffer says, yeah, laughter, now we have a problem. Trump says, isn't that interesting? And notably, when this happened, the writer, the publisher, and Trump's two staff members did not have security clearances or any need to know on any classified information about a plan of attack on country A. There's also another instance mentioned in August or September of 2021, with Trump not only showing off a classified map to a PAC representative, even commenting that he shouldn't be showing him this, with that representative reportedly having no security clearance or any need to know. And again, those are just two of my quick favorite moments. Just Trump being exposed in a bald-faced lie. And most importantly, by himself. Self. And like I said, we're going to talk about more and more specifics as the situation develops. And this is, it, it's going to be one of the key stories this week. And it'll have constant updates, like his two lawyers on the case resigning and now the firm representing him in a New York business fraud case taking up the mantle. And beyond just that, things aren't looking particularly good for Trump. Especially because as we learned going into the weekend, Trump's not facing seven charges. He is facing 37. 31 counts of willful retention of national defense information, right? We're talking about the Espionage Act. One count false statements and representations. And in addition to that, both he and his aide, Walt Nauta, face one count of conspiracy to obstruct justice, one count of withholding a document or record, one count of corruptly concealing a document or record, one count of concealing a document in a federal investigation, and one count of scheme to conceal. And Nauta by himself also facing an additional count of false statements and representation. And again, most importantly, this is all connected, as the indictment notes, to the classified documents Trump stored in his boxes, including information regarding defense and weapon capabilities of both the United States and foreign countries, United States nuclear programs, potential vulnerabilities of the United States and his allies to military attack, and plans for possible retaliation in response to a foreign attack. But as the situation develops, it's going to be very interesting to see what the public reactions are. Because before the specifics came out, you had Republicans saying this was a targeted attack. Nikki Haley saying this is not how justice should be pursued in our country. Saying the American people are exhausted by the prosecutorial overreach, double standards, and vendetta politics. Even Mike, Trump's supporters wanted to hang me, Pence, saying that he was deeply troubled by the indictment. Meanwhile, you had Trump saying that Biden should also be indicted. But regarding that, you had Republican Senator Mitt Romney explaining why those two situations are in no way related. Saying in a statement, by all appearances, the Justice Department and Special Counsel 
of exercise due care, affording Mr. Trump the time and opportunity to avoid charges that would not generally have been afforded to others. Mr. Trump brought these charges upon himself by not only taking classified documents, but by refusing to simply return them when given numerous opportunities to do so. Which, of course, is the key big difference. Trump kept hiding documents, and to our knowledge, Biden has turned over the documents he wasn't aware he even had. And I mean, same with the likes of Mike Pence. And again, that was even before the indictment was unsealed and we got more damning evidence against Trump. But like I said, we're going to be talking more about the specifics, the fallout, the reaction, the domino effect here throughout this week. So that's where I'm going to actually end today's show. Whether it be this final big story or anything I talked about today, of course, I'd love to know your thoughts in those comments down below. But as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.